Good evening, everybody, and, and a very warm welcome to tonight's event. The Senior Lecture is, is Sperry's biggest public event each year, and we're absolutely thrilled that it is back in person for the first time, really, since, since, since COVID struck. And it's a real highlight of our university calendar. It's an important part of the university's work to, to communicate new and sometimes complex ideas and insights in a way that appeals broadly. So each year, Sperry invites eminent public figures um, from the world of politics or economics uh, to come to Sheffield to discuss some of the most important issues that affect our lives. And in the past, we've had leader of the opposition, then Ed Miliband, we've had ITV's political editor, Robert Peston, leading economist and journalist Stephanie Flanders, and Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. And this year, we are very privileged to be hearing from a major political figure in our own region, and that is South Yorkshire's mayor, Oliver Coppard. So Oliver was elected in May this year, and he replaced the region's first ever metro mayor, who was Dan Jarvis, when Dan stood down at the end of his term. And at that time, I doubt that Oliver could have foreseen that he would be dealing with a third prime minister six months later, nor perhaps the scale of some of the economic challenges the country now faces. So tonight, Oliver will be speaking to us about leading with pride and, and uh, about local leadership's indispensable role in delivering the UK's economic and constitutional renewal. Now, this is, of course, a very pertinent topic at a time when the government continues to grapple, it seems, with what it means when it talks about leveling up and how leveling up will be delivered. When Oliver was elected, he pledged to rebuild the pride, prosperity, and purpose of South Yorkshire. And I'm sure he will share his thoughts with us tonight on the role that local leadership can play in achieving that. By way of background, Oliver was born and bred in South Yorkshire and before becoming mayor, worked with young people in Barnsley. He led low carbon regeneration projects in the Dern Valley. And you may also recall that he ran against former Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg for the Sheffield Hallam seat at the 2015 general election. Until recently, he was leading on government relationships for a national charity. We're thrilled that Oliver is sharing his views and insights with us tonight. The university works closely, as you would expect, with the South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority, and we are very proud of the work that we have done together to help improve lives in our region. For example, by establishing the South Yorkshire Sustainability Centre to help the region meet net zero emission targets, which are rightly very ambitious, and by building a gene therapy innovation and manufacturing centre so that we can translate scientific discovery into new treatments revolutionary treatments for rare genetic diseases. So after his talk, if there is time, Oliver has agreed to answer some of your questions, so please do think about anything you may want to ask. I'm sure it will be a very thought-provoking and very enjoyable evening, so please well, join me in welcoming our speaker, Oliver Coppart. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. Um, this is going to be my longest and most formal speech that I've given since becoming mayor. I'm honoured, especially given the calibre of previous lecturers and those filling the hall this evening. I'm lucky to have, though, a good team around me who have supported me in pulling this together. Before I came here tonight, I asked them what I should say, and they told me, don't be too funny, no, not a problem. Don't be too charming, ditto. And don't be too intellectual, which I'm sure you will let me know afterwards if I've met that mark. Just be yourself, they said. But seriously, it's great to uh, be here and it's a great honour to be speaking to you 10 years after the foundation of Sperry. Sperry's work over the last decade has focused on building a more humane economy, a sustainable environment, a just international settlement and a better and kinder politics. So I'm pleased to say mission accomplished, I think. Thank you and good night, we're done. Three years ago, Andy Haldane opened his Sperry Lecture with the famous line from the former Speaker of the US House of Representatives, Tip O'Neill, that all politics are local. He went on to argue that all economics is local too. Like the seashore, 
looking at the economy at the regional and local level brings out more of its richness, complexity, self-similarity. We could say the same of our communities. Only when we take the time to look at how national and global political projects are playing out locally do we see the full kaleidoscope of political identities at play. If all politics is local and all economics is local, then the process of forming our social and political identities is local too. I believe this truth has been ignored by national politicians and pundits for too long. They've pursued abstract political projects which play out in places like South Yorkshire, often without or even against our consent. One particular project stands out. The attempt, as Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel puts it, to move the UK from a market economy to a market society. We've seen this happen within my lifetime in South Yorkshire. But when the mines shut down and the steelworks closed, our industrial communities responded with the cry for dignity, coal, not dole. We have never lost that impulse to put people first. Today, I want to argue that the experiment of Metro Mayors offers a promising path to resisting that atomization and fracturing of our society to rebuilding social capital, economic inclusion, solidarity and hope. People like me, working with people like you in this room, can nourish our sense of regional identity into a full-blown political identity and into the basis for a South Yorkshire democracy. The institution of the mayoralty enables it. But realising that goal also means the UK has to change. There are some who cling to the myth of the unitary UK, where every action must be one size fits all and where regional identities are relegated, if at all, to comic voices on radio or TV. When we have rejected that message before, the country has thrived. To renew the UK for the 21st century, I would argue we must challenge it again. This is my first academic lecture as mayor. You'll have to bear with me, as it's also my first attempt to define copardism. <laughs> T-shirts are available in the foyer. One of my reflections as I was preparing for tonight is that academic language can obscure as much as it can clarify, especially when coming out of the mouth of a politician like me. Talk of capitalism, neoliberalism, technological change or atomization only really resonates when we can tie it to something we've actually experienced. The loss of a job in the name of commercial viability the loneliness of a neighbour or family member, the hours long wait for medical attention or stuck on a broken train after a decade of austerity. All of us in this room, the students, academics, political and community leaders, me, we have all our own experiences of how the often abstract forces that I've already mentioned are impacting on our own lives. I'm from a family of refugees. My grandparents came to this country in the 1930s fleeing Nazi persecution in Central Europe. This country gave them sanctuary. It gave them prospects at home at the same time as it led to the fight to stamp out Nazism and hate abroad. My grandparents went on to become teachers, nourishing the next generation of the community that had welcomed them. From them, and millions like them, I learned that what happens in our community is not distinct from the deep tectonic plates that underpin our global system. It's a th sad thing to reflect on, but their story has been played out in every successive generation in South Yorkshire, from Somali and Yemeni refugees arriving in our region in the 1980s and 1990s, to Ukrainian, Hong Kong and Afghan refugees today. Nor can we say the stain of racism and authoritarianism has been fully removed from Britain. Indeed, not even in my own party, though I am pleased we are now taking firm action against anti-Semitism. My dad, who some of you in the room may know, chose to base himself in Barnsley throughout his career in local government. I embrace both my heritage of migration and persecution and my firm roots in South Yorkshire. I was born in Sheffield, indeed, on the hospital that used to stand on this ground. I was raised in Sheffield, I ran for parliament here, and it is my great privilege to serve as the mayor of the region that has always been my home. But it took time for me to realise that politics was where I could contribute inspired, like so many from afar, by the community-led, optimistic Obama campaign in 2008, I was determined to experience that sense of empowerment for myself. When the time came for his re-election, I jumped at the opportunity to head to New Hampshire as a volunteer. There, I saw a way of doing politics that was different to the often sclerotic local bureaucracies I was used to. It was politics that started from the assumption that there are leaders everywhere, on every street, in every workplace, in every classroom. 
Obama was a vessel for that hope, but he made clear that his inspiration came from the people committed to improving their community wherever they were. This is not about a small coterie of advisors thrashing out a party line to passive activists. The logic was flipped. Act local, build power in your community, and channel this up to politicians who will empower you and be empowered by you. Building on the organizing tradition stretching from the civil rights movement through Saul Alinsky, Cesar Chavez to Marshall Gantz. I came back determined to take that people first approach to building a campaign in Sheffield. I decided to run to be the MP for Sheffield Hallam, just up the road from where we are tonight. I showed my commitment to those activists by investing the best part of two years of my own life in the pursuit of what was then seen as a frankly hopeless cause. When I was selected as Labour candidate, the Daily, Le Daily Mail labelled me Twit of the Week um, for daring to suggest that we could win the Deputy Prime Minister's seat, which had never before voted Labour. I lost in 2015, but we achieved a near 20-point swing in a year when Labour nationally saw a swing of just 1.5%, and the country returned its first Conservative majority in 23 years. And I'm proud that today, Hallam is now painted red on our political maps. However, in the seven years from the election to my election, it would be fair to say that parliamentary politics has not exactly covered itself in glory. In a time when global flux, both of our national parties turned away from their responsibilities in pursuit of their own partial dogmas, detached from or blind to the needs of our communities. For me, that abrogation of responsibility was personal. I called out Jeremy Corbyn's toleration of anti-Semitism and said that I would not stand for the Labour Party while the age-old racism of anti-Semitism stained our party. I'm proud today to take my place as a Labour mayor and the UK's most senior Jewish leader in local and regional government. For their part, the Conservative Party has been riven by its own divisions over Brexit and a right-wing fundamentalism which has challenged their own traditions, drawing attention away from governing in the interests of the many for the fixations of the few. But if parliamentary democracy is falling short, the question is, what is the alternative? I've already tried one of them. After 2015, I took on the job of heading the Remain campaign in Yorkshire, the Humber and Lincolnshire, another stunning success. <laughs> the referendum, like the Scottish independence referendum two years earlier, misinformed rather than enlightened, polarized rather than unified intentionally distracted attention away from our fundamental problems. It has split our political parties and continues to absorb the energy of officials and businesses six years on, preventing action on the climate emergency, quality jobs, or building international security and solidarity. When used to force a debate on, the issue, on an issue or impose a solution, rather than to draw a line under one following lengthy and informed deliberation, as in Scottish devolution, referenda almost always weaken rather than strengthen our democracies. Recognising that flaw, Clement Attlee described them as alien to our traditions and an instrument of tyranny over democracy. I agree. The Leave campaign did get one thing right, though. Their message, take back control, was like an exocet missile at the heart of the disempowered, hollowed out communities of South Yorkshire and so many communities like ours. Theoma Fetzer found in a 2019 paper that data for the UK since 2000 supports the view that individual and community exposure to austerity increased support for Brexit. The size of this effect is such that without austerity, his model suggests we would have avoided Brexit altogether. That impact was clear to any of us who worked on the campaign or who were and are embedded in the politics of our communities. That is a story that plays out all too clearly here in South Yorkshire. The average northern city saw a 20% cut to public spending from 2010 to 2019. We've all felt it, compared to 9% in the South. Barnsley saw the, late, the largest reduction in funding for services of any metropolitan area in the country at 40%. In somewhere like Barnsley, and I think this is true anywhere in South Yorkshire, this means a proud community with a strong tradition, having its economy dismantled for the second time in as many generations. First with the closure of the mines, then with the removal of public services and jobs that had replaced them, offering hope and the route to a stronger economy and society. Those same places are again vulnerable to trade shocks related to Brexit. George Osborne and David Cameron broke communities they will never know and never understood. And I fear that this is about to be played out again next week by Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak. People are right to be angry as their communities see resources withdrawn by distant and increasingly absent state, 
leaving behind either no jobs or bad jobs. The referendum of 2016 has failed to right these wrongs. Indeed, in some cases, it has made things worse. But any successful democratic alternative must tackle these challenges head on. If a, render, if a referendum is too crude to resolve our problems, and if Westminster politics is too dysfunctional, is there a better way? That was the question I found myself asking a year ago as I weighed up standing to be Labour's candidate for Mayor of South Yorkshire or to once again try to become a Member of Parliament, potentially here in Sheffield Central. I saw the strides local leaders were taking in Wales, in London, in Greater Manchester and the potential here in South Yorkshire. I recognised the value of a more immediately accountable but sufficiently strategic level of government, perhaps best illustrated by the experiences of Scotland over the past quarter century as the only region to have kept pace with UK economic averages while all other regions and countries have fallen back against London and the South East. But more than that, I recognise the creation of Metro Mayors as a crucial experiment in the political economy of the UK. National government has created a new tier of government in England on the gamble that more personalised leadership can help improve accountability and local democracy. Hedging their bets though, Whitehall did this without devolving meaningful powers or money, except the bare minimum needed to convince sceptical local leaders. Not the most promising start. But if we get it right, the potential opportunity is, I think, huge. For Westminster, it answers the England question. How do you govern a union of nations when one of them is home to 80% of the population? For Whitehall, it answers the Kissinger question. Who do you call when you want to speak to South Yorkshire? For the other nations of the UK and for those in England let down by a government culture skewed to the southeast, it answers the political question. How can we express our identity and local demands among peer regions and nations? And for economists and businesses, it answers the question of how we can drive balanced growth across our country and realise the potential of all our communities. We need no longer be a jet plane flying with only one engine flying on all cylinders. A lopsided political economy in the UK is a choice and not an inevitability. So what question faces the new cohort of mayors like me? Some of these are well understood. How do we deliver inclusive, sustainable growth and improve the well-being of our communities. But I want to argue that there is a question that is often missing, unconscious or unsaid in our political debate. How can we craft a political identity for our region to match our new institutions? How do we create a new common sense so people here see it as perfectly natural and normal that there is a South Yorkshire mayor who they hold to account for fixing regional problems? This is a necessary ingredient. Without a sense of South Yorkshire identity, my role is dependent on the goodwill of the government of the day. With it, my office is more secure and the virtuous circle of rising expectations, greater scrutiny and improved delivery will kick in. Whitehill will see mayors as stronger, more durable and more credible partners and trust us with the powers and funding to deliver more. We've seen that gradual ratcheting up of devolution play out already in Wales and in Scotland. The chance to lead that change in my home region was a challenge I couldn't resist. And in developing my campaign, I tried to capture in the simplest possible terms, as Cohen has already said, what I wanted for our region. I settled on three words, pride, prosperity, and purpose. Restoring and rebuilding the pride we once had in our industrial heritage and pioneering industries. The purpose that defined our place in the world and the prosperity we retained that allowed our communities to flourish. I believe we can show a different approach to politics. One better connected to the community, but with the scale and influence to shape national policy. If we can do that, we can break through parochialism and avoid the charge of dividing the UK. If we are to realise the ambition though, there are two things missing, which I cannot address alone. First, we need to build a self-regarding political identity here in South Yorkshire. People must view that identity as a basis for political organisation and delivery, rather than something that is just cultural. This is the fundamental challenge that I am grappling with, as England's mayors have mainly been created without overwhelming popular demand. Devolution to South Yorkshire has not come after 20 years of civil society organising, regional commissions and a full-blown regionalisation of politics, as in Scotland. In Scotland, political identity preceded the institutions. We are largely building things the other way around. I need to be able to show the people of Askin that they benefit from the investments we will make here with our universities, at the heart of South Yorkshire's innovation economy. I need to be able to show the people of Doddeth that the investments we make in Rother Valley will deliver better jobs and opportunities for their families. 
Second, we need a reformed political culture in the UK. Failing to ease the centralised grip on England's regions we see today, while regional political identities are planted and taking root, is a recipe for further political fragmentation and strife. We should not build stronger political identities just to pit them against each other. Our current approach of divide and rule, of having places bid for small competitive pots of cash to build public toilets or keep buses on the road, is wasteful and corrosive. Funding driven by political calculation rather than needs of our communities will simply not deliver levelling up. Without UK-wide reform, we either risk a central backlash against devolved and mayoral powers or a fra fracturing of Britain. Neither will build up the political agency or regional solidarity we need to move our country forward this century. Let me take the question of building a political community and identity first. I don't think it's an impossible task. Our identities are not immutable. In less than a decade, we have seen a rise in the self-identification of people in the UK as English, Scottish, or Welsh, rather than British. And in the wake of Brexit, a surge in those seemingly seeing themselves as decisively European or otherwise. I, I personally see myself as from Sheffield, from South Yorkshire, a Yorkshireman, English, Jewish, British, and European. I'm an Arsenal fan, and I'll be in red, facing, I'll be red in the face shouting things I shouldn't repeat on this stage at fans of Tottenham Hotspurs. But come the World Cup later this month, we will all be cheering on England. Our identities change over time and place, but they are all there and they are all real. I would have to accept, though, that South Yorkshire is arguably the least politically defined of those identities, especially compared to the city regions of London or Liverpool. The sense of being a distinct community within but not wholly defined by being English is there in Liverpool in a way that is less clear here. I mentioned earlier that we all bring our own experiences to bear on abstractions. South Yorkshire is a case in point. It's the sum of the shared experiences of those of us who live here, have lived here, or have an idea of, in their head of what South Yorkshire is like. That could be the industrial apocalypse of Blake's dark satanic mills, the post-industrial dislocated home of pulp and the Arctic monkeys, the much fated Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire, leading the country's ambitions on social housing and transport the industrial battles or the industrial battles that brought an end to the area, that era in the 1980s. Or it could be the warm and friendly communities scattered across our beautiful valleys and peaks. All of these experiences are true and valid in their own way. What I can do as mayor, alongside our artists, historians, and 1.4 million of our fellow residents, is to interpret and articulate our shared experiences, creating opportunities for the people of South Yorkshire to build a shared sense of community and purpose. My hypothesis as I do that is that a common thread of our South Yorkshire political identity is that as a region, currently we lack self-belief, confidence and agency. We're the victims of forces outside of our control. Managed decline is our lot in life. Sometimes we let those on the outside portray it that way too. An all too common telling of our recent history runs from the Battle of Orgreef and the miners' strike through the Hillsborough disaster into the collapse of employment in the steel industry captured in films like The Full Monty or Brassed Off, to more recently the scandals and tragedies of child sexual exploitation. What these add up to is an often pervasive sense of a place where our best days are behind us, bedeviled by social ills and fated for decline. I see every day in my role as mayor that this is simply not true. Over the last six months, I've been lucky enough to see firsthand the pride and passion of those people in our region committed to living their life by the motto of South Yorkshire. Each shall strive for the welfare of all. Their absolute determination, determination to protect and serve all of our communities. Julie Kenny, who has taken on the frankly outrageous task of restoring Wentworth Woodhouse, once the largest private house in the UK. The founders of Rivlin Robotics, creating world leading technology from an office in Callum Island. Mark Chadwick, who responded to the news about Peel Group looking at the future viability of our airport by bringing thousands of people together in online in just a few days to share news, information, and build a campaign to fight for Doncaster Sheffield Airport's future. And Dave Richards from One Disco, potentially the region's first unicorn, creating the next generation of programmers and wealth creators here in South Yorkshire. I've been inspired by the dignity and passion of their service to our community, their refusal to accept the status quo and their pursuit of a future that is greater than either our, either our present or our recent past. Their reach forever exceeding our grasp. 
because there is no shortage of expectation and no limit to people's courage or resolve. And we have done this before. The past glories that people in South Yorkshire look back to, a world full of industrial employment, an expansive welfare state, and an ambitious local and regional leadership of 2P bus fares and utopian cities in the sky under the Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire. They were themselves the product of previous attempts to build a radical identity here in our region. We look, now, we look back now to the post-war settlement in the UK and ignore the 70 years of work before that to build up a self-conscious labour movement, organise it and direct it to take political power and reconfigure our political economy in the interests of non-elites. This is the double movement that Karl Polanyi wrote about, the rise of an organised working class in response to the laissez-faire Victorian era. It was the fruit of the combined work of generations of artists, writers, neighbourhoods and religious leaders, trade unions, local politicians and intellectuals. With an ever-growing self-confidence, they articulated a different vision of the UK, of our local communities and convinced people that this optimistic and better vision was worth fighting for. Before the centralising reforms of the Thatcher era, they also had the power and the money to give it life. We need the same today. Only Metro mayors, I would argue, or the national parliaments in Wales and Scotland truly see this creative act of defining an alternative that fits with their history, their heritage, and their dialect as integral to their work. Underpinning my argument here is a theory of democracy that builds up and out from the lived experience of our communities. It starts not with the inheritance of monarchical power flowing out of Westminster across the country, but bottom up, from the enterprise and solidarity of our communities. To allow our communities to live with dignity, we must change things with them rather than doing things to them. Reciprocity between communities and those who hold power and trust is how we begin to restore faith in British politics. This same principle of reciprocity and of rootedness should guide our economy too. If ever it were possible to direct the commanding heights of the economy from Whitehall, it is not an option anymore. Decentralisation is needed to unlock local value, enabling on-the-ground discretion rather than jarring bureaucracy. Those industries that thrive do so when they are firmly entrenched in local economic systems. But the political temptation to cling on to policy-making power nationally is strong too. We have a UK government that acts as if we can still direct from the centre, even as our economies have both globalised and localised. The political result is predictable. Those industries close to power in London with the ear of ministers have the most sway. Just as power fails to trickle down, so does economic growth, except where local and regional leaders take it upon themselves to provide an alternative. True social justice and economic efficiency demands that we make the most of talent and industries across the UK. This means creating a system where local, regional and UK-wide wide government work in harmony. What does that look like in practice? One of the advantages of being the UK being a relative latecomer to decentralisation is that we can learn from other countries in the OECD. Just as in South Yorkshire, I can learn from what my colleagues in Greater Manchester, London and Wales have done ahead of us. But we can look abroad too and go well beyond the usual suspects of federal states like Germany and the US into unitary states that until the 1970s looked much like the UK, such as Spain, Italy, France or Sweden. What would it mean if we borrowed their approaches to decentralisation? Well, my officials and I would be sat in working groups with ministers and officials routinely, giving us a forum for joint working. Budgets and national policies would be agreed with me, rather than being subject merely to consultation or more typically, simply imposed. I would have the power to pass local legislation for a time limited period, which could be generalised across the country if it proved successful. And I would have a direct voice in the upper chamber of parliament so that I could press the case to national ministers directly and personally propose legislative alternatives. With the announcement today that Boris Johnson's resignation honours list recommends a peerage for Ben Houchin, the Mayor of Tees Valley, I'm pleased to see that Boris Johnson is belatedly getting on board with at least part of my plan. <laughs> Let me illustrate what this might look like with the example of the biggest challenge that I've faced since becoming Mayor, the closure of Doncaster Sheffield Airport, which is potentially happening this week and risks plunging hundreds of families here in South Yorkshire into uncertainty as we head into a winter cost of living crisis. Working alongside the Mayor of Doncaster, Ross Jones, I've been working with the current owners, potential investors, and a plethora of consultants and legal advisors to find a viable future for the airport. 
Leaders across South Yorkshire have found millions of pounds that could be used to support a transition for the airport as part of a locally led plan to secure its future viability. Every step along the way, we've been stifled, though, by the inaction, insensitivity and disinterest of national government and a nationally set legislative framework that imposes a straitjacket on what we could achieve locally. The Secretary of State for Transport repeatedly failed to meet with me and South Yorkshire MPs. Our efforts to identify statutory instruments they could use were met with a non-response and their political choice was to side with the company over the community. A strong local coalition underpinned by the likes of Mark Chadwick, an activist brought together over social media, were able to secure 127,000 signatures for a petition to national government, and yet it achieved nothing. There is little stopping government simply ignoring residents, which is what they have done, and the law, law favours the absolute discretion of the property owner over the community that has both invested in its success and stands to carry the losses. In a better system, I would have been able to insist on the formation of a working group between ministers and my team, perhaps subject to the agreement of my fellow mayors, rather than being stonewalled. We would have been able to provide a unified front in pushing the airport owners to accept my offer of bridging support and incredibly raising the stakes by threatening their investments elsewhere in the UK, rather than being isolated. We could have considered other statutory tools to expand the opportunities for renegotiation, rather than simply being powerless. Finally, I would be able to promote a change in the law that, so that this could not happen again, extending the statutory requirements to consult and engage the market for other interested parties before a closure could be considered for privately owned critical infrastructure. I could do none of those things though. We were ignored and now for the second time in 30 years, South Yorkshire runs the risk of becoming the largest urban area in Western Europe to lack an airport. Our failed governance directly contributes to the continued imbalances of our economy and our country. What I have sketched out so far, I, I admit, is radical. The creation of regional political identities across England and a rewiring of the UK state to empower those nations and regions rather than suppress them. It will require political courage at a local, regional and national level to deliver, and it is not going to be quick, quick cheap or easy. The most obvious risk is failure. Mayors may fail to activate new optimistic identities and fail to steer local economies in a better direction. This is not an unreasonable view, by the way. Last month, Britain in a Changing Europe published a paper painting a sobering picture for those of us in office. Only 30% of people in England trust their mayor, hard as that is to believe, local MP or local council to care about their area. That only 14% say the same of national government should not be a source of comfort though for people like me. However, that same fact explains why local leaders are in the best place to at least try. Reform is even less likely to succeed if led by an untrusted national government alone. Similarly, we can take hope from early and partial evidence that suggests devolution is working. The most substantive piece I've seen to date comes from a paper in The Lancet earlier this year, isolating the effect of health and social care devolution in Greater Manchester and identifying a marked rise in healthy life expectancy there as a result. If we give mayors time to deliver, I expect we will see a growing evidence base to support their success. The second risk is what you could describe perhaps at the risk of being overly dramatic as the balkanisation of our country. Low trust in national politics coupled with an erosion of ties to UK political institutions could lead to an unravelling of our country. At the very least, it could empower separatist and national movements as we have seen already in Scotland. In Nicola Sturgeon's speech, she argued for inclusive, prosperous communities that were internationally connected, overseen by responsive social democratic government, governments, something I can wholeheartedly endorse. While I have a huge amount of respect for the First Minister personally though, it won't surprise you to hear that I disagree with her ultimate constitutional goal of an end to the union. Because it must be just that, a union. Identity politics gets a bad name. We can define our identity negatively. In the SNP's case, against Britain. Or we can define it positively in terms of the richest depth, traditions and quirks of our homes and our communities. I'm an advocate of a positive, expansive and inclusive identity politics for the UK. Improving regional governance in the UK and improving Westminster and Whitehall's responsiveness to those regions is about empowering places to act in solidarity. It is not about creating a new doggy dog marketplace within our country. Another way of making that same point is to say that this is about getting the right powers to the right level, complementing and refining our political identities as we do so. Just as I will work to craft a South Yorkshire identity, 
Others craft the Yorkshire identity, and our MPs in the region shape the British identity. For each identity, there will be an appropriate set of powers, although it has its attractions, I am not seeking to lead a private army here in South Yorkshire. I certainly don't want a South Yorkshire HMRC. I'm happy for those to stay with the UK government. At the other extreme, we should not discount the opportunities for ever more local devolution to empower our neighbourhoods and communities to act for themselves on the most immediate issues. Is that a wildly utopian goal? I don't think it is. Unlike some, I do not believe that the UK's politics is fundamentally broken, that our only choice is to go back to the drawing board. On the contrary, I see the strength of our constitution in its openness to reform. When it's political masters and the public push for it. That I'm addressing you today as the mayor of South Yorkshire, a post that has only existed since 2018, is a testament to that pragmatism. We have one of the oldest uninterrupted constitutional settlements in the world precisely because of its capability to flex to radically different economic needs and international structures. Here, as, in much, as much as it pains to say me, I have to give credit to George Osborne, who knowingly handed over new powers to a tier of government he knew would be led by the Labour Party. While we can argue about the pre precise powers and funding and recognising that obviously it's still early days, Metro mayors are now major economic and political play pay players, provided we can use our formal and informal powers well. So no pressure, I suppose. When I look at South Yorkshire, our combined authority universities and the health and social care system, which I oversee as chair of the IC ICP, together we employ about 200,000 people, more than a third of all the jobs in this region. We support far more through the supply chain and by providing the skilled, healthy people and the infrastructure needed for others to thrive. Both national parties are starting to understand this. When Labour takes power nationally, it will inherit a new structure of regional mayors. It has not had to govern in partnership with metropolitan areas in that way since 1979. Gordon Brown will be putting forward his commission for the future of the United Kingdom in the coming months, setting out Labour's position. That cannot simply be a return to the world as it was in 2010, of nationally directed regional development agencies, learning and skills councils and the rest. Instead, Labour must choose more democracy and more immediacy in our politics. Investment publicly backed if needed, into local news, community groups and community owned assets, will give power and voice to our communities to hold me and others to account. 10 years ago, Sperry was founded in response to a crisis in our politics, our economy and our society. I wish we could say that we had learned all the lessons of the global financial crisis and then the Euro crisis. The truth is that we patently did not. Let us hope that in 10 years time, the same is not said as the recovery from the global pandemic and the perma crisis of 2022. One of the lessons of the last decade is that we will not do better by adopting more austerity and more centralization. Policy support to regional government, to local government and directly to communities must be central to the renewal of the UK. This is not just a message to white decision makers in Whitehall. All of us in every workplace decision, neighborhood chat, academic paper, arts event, will face the choice of whether we act to treat our region seriously as a political player. I would implore you to build your organization, organizations around South Yorkshire's geography. For those of you based in Sheffield, ask what you can do for Barnsley, Rotherham or Doncaster and vice versa. I urge you to write and lecture on our textured history of coal, steel, struggle and solidarity and help me create our future of green democratic jobs building on our craft, industrial and manufacturing traditions. I need all the help and ideas I can get. And I really mean it, genuinely. You should get in touch with me if you can make a change happen for South Yorkshire. As South Yorkshire's Mayor, I will stand alongside you in that journey. Together, we can build a new South Yorkshire, holding its head high and walking with swagger as a partner and example to the other regions and nations of the UK. As I said before, under the crest of South Yorkshire, itself only created in 1974, it says each shall strive for the welfare of all. If we are to restore the pride, purpose and prosperity of South Yorkshire, I cannot do it alone. I look forward to working with you all to make South Yorkshire great again. Caps are available in the foyer. Thank you very much. <laughs>